for me, hiring excellence is meeting a company or hiring manager where they are and understanding that it's not one size fits all. Welcome to Offer Accepted, the podcast that elevates your recruiting game. Your host, Shannon Ogborn, interviews top talent acquisition leaders, uncovering their secrets to building and leading successful recruiting teams, gain valuable insights and actionable advice from analyzing cutting edge metrics to claiming your seat at the table. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Offer Accepted. I'm Shannon Ogborn, your host, and this episode is brought to you by Ashby, the all-in-one recruiting platform empowering ambitious teams from C to IPO and beyond. I could not be more excited for this episode because we have our very own sourcer at Ashby, Liz. Liz has been in talent acquisition for more than eight years, including four and a half years at Google, where she focused on hiring for product management and engineering roles. She was also in executive search for two and a half years, where she had the opportunity to work with more than 50 founders and co-founders to source and hire executives for their startups, particularly across go-to-market roles. She also had a pre-recruiting life that involved being a teacher, writer, and editor, all while traveling and living abroad. Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I would love if you could give our listeners just a little bit more background on yourself and your current work. Yeah, so I'm currently a sourcer at Ashby. I support roles across the company, everything from engineering to customer success and support, sales, marketing, finance, you name it. And I have worked on it at some point in my career from individual contributors all the way up to the C-suite. Amazing. And for those who who don't know, uh, Liz is absolutely crushing it here. So we're so grateful to, to have her on the team. But as you had mentioned, you've been in the TA space for a pretty long tenure now, what opportunities have you seen come up over that time for recruiting teams? Yeah. So as you mentioned, you know, in the intro, I've done in-house executive search. I've done big company. I've done startup. No one experience has been like any of the others, but all of them have been ripe for innovation and especially for kind of cross-pollinating the ways that each operates. And I think there is a huge opportunity for more sharing and collaboration around new ways of thinking about sourcing, new strategies and tools, including in, in forums like this. You know, as sourcers, we often have the opportunity to work closely with hiring managers and get to know their team and job descriptions and figure out what their hiring needs look like. But how often, you know, have we sat with salespeople to see how they do prospecting and manage their leads, right? How often have we shadowed marketing to see how they approach outbound nurture campaigns? How do your engineers or product managers research product specs? How do they think about user experience, right? All of those things fall within the sourcer's role, just in a slightly different context. And I'm personally drawn to the idea of sharing access to this kind of insight, whether through a more open discussion across disciplines or even just as a fly on the wall, observing how other teams operate. I love that so much. And when you and I had chatted earlier, you had mentioned this idea of market mapping to fill this opportunity gap and thinking about sourcing as a research function, which was so interesting to me, specifically when it comes to DEI initiatives. Can you elaborate a little bit more on sort of what market mapping is and how it how it plays out in the recruiting function? Yeah, so market mapping is kind of one iteration and it does mean slightly different things to different people. But the idea is to basically broaden how we think about the sourcing function from a strategic and process perspective. So strategically, it means going beyond just the industry that your company is in or your company's top competitors. I think when you limit sourcing to top competitors, you limit your own hiring to who they have hired historically, which is very ineffective from a DEI perspective. But then you also limit your own company to what your competitors have achieved through their talent, right? No No founder's goal is to get to what their competitors have achieved and then stop there. So what a broader strategy might look like can be very nuanced as it will vary a lot across the board. Absolutely. And for those who haven't heard of this mapping concept before, can you give an example of what this would look like in practice from a sourcing perspective? Yeah, sure. So I can give a concrete example to illustrate. So let's say, for example, you're a Series B B2C company, so selling direct to consumers, and you're looking for your first VP of marketing. One place you can start is the buyer persona. 
what kinds of companies have marketed to the same buyer as your company. We can look at the type of product or platform that it is. Is it a two or three sided marketplace? Is it technically complex or simple for adoption? What is the revenue model? Is it freemium? Is it subscription? Is it pay per seat? And the stage, right? We said your hypothetical company is Series B. If you're hiring your first VP of marketing, it's probably not to take your Series B company to still Series B. So you'd likely want to th- find people who joined a company relatively early, let's, stay, let's say at or around a similar stage, which also indicates they have experience in smaller, scrappier environments, and then who then saw that company through growth, whether through Series C or D or beyond, whatever that might be. Think about it the way the hiring manager is thinking about it. So in terms of what they need from this hire. And there's your starting point for building out a targeted list of companies and for finding the people who have had the right positions at those companies at the right time for the stages of growth that you're targeting. From there, you can go even deeper and consider the different personas. So for example, the tenured profile that has done this before and can recreate it, or the high trajectory up and comer with a lot of potential. Maybe you pipeline for both and see what becomes most appealing for the hiring team through the interview process. This is just one hypothetical example. There are literally endless ways to think strategically based on the product, the role, the stage, et cetera. And then process-wise, what are the tools that you can use to accomplish this research? So part of it goes back to good old-fashioned search. There's a lot of targeted lists of companies out there, for example, and They are pretty easy to find, um, covering anything you could think of from top fintech companies to PLG startups, the Cloud 100 list, up and coming unicorns. There's tons of them. But what I recommend is augmenting that with your own individual research, because those lists will never be as comprehensive as you can be. As a sourcer, you're an expert or you should strive to be an expert in finding things, information, people, companies, etc., And then to build your company target list or your market map, find a platform where you can filter, manipulate, and pull the data that you need. One of my favorite questions, which I've actually been asked several times before, is how did you find this person? They're perfect for the role. Or alternatively, how did you find me? This role is perfect for my background. And there's actually an art and a science behind it. And I think it's worth sharing. 100%. And what I'm really excited about is coming up after the this podcast episode, in the near future, we will have you on a webinar to look at more specifically the tools and in your actual process for this. But I think it's such a such a great point that sourcers should be an expert in finding things, and that includes the research. So I find this concept extremely interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more about where did this concept evolve from? Yeah, you know, I've thought about this a lot, and I think. For me, it goes back to how sourcing and recruiting in general has often been perceived externally outside of TA teams, but also to a certain extent internally in the way that we kind of see ourselves. I remember when I started my first role as a sourcer at Google, there was this perception that sourcers were like junior recruiters, that it's, you know, a foot in the door. And one day, if we work really hard, we can graduate into a real recruiter role. Now that's definitely a less common way of thinking about sourcing than it was eight, nine years ago, but it's still kind of out there. I also recently heard someone say that sourcers and recruiters don't set out to do that job, but they kind of fall into it because their first career failed, which is funny because, you know, in TA, a lot of us acknowledge that you don't necessarily go to college to become a recruiter or sourcer, that you kind of just end up there in one way or another. And that's often true. It certainly was for me. But that doesn't mean you were a failure in a previous career. And more importantly, it doesn't mean that it's an unskilled function. And so I think it's important to highlight, you know, the skill and strategy and innovation that has been developed, that is still developing within sourcing and to share that so more sourcers can continue to hone their craft. Absolutely. And I love what you said about this not being an unskilled function. And I love that ideas like this of the market mapping just showcase how much recruiters and sourcers really invest in their skills and going about things strategically because it's not always the way recruiting is viewed externally. So I love that we get to sit down and have this conversation about how skilled these these roles can be. So 
On the tactical side, what advice can you offer to listeners for their day-to-day work or even for folks who are currently searching for their next opportunity? Because the finding things piece is actually relevant on on both sides of the market here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely, you know, apply apply your sourcing skills for finding your next role 100% and get creative about it. I think that's kind of required for this particular moment in time. I would encourage people to sort of take a step back and consider the moment that companies are in right now, whether the company that you're working for or the ones where you're applying for jobs. What made you successful in times of hypergrowth isn't necessarily what will make you successful now. And I would recommend thinking about what shifts may be needed and how you approach your work or how you speak to that experience. And then finally, have opinions about how things should be done. I think we've moved beyond the days of just doing order intake. And I think hiring managers are often looking for that guidance as well. So don't be afraid to speak up and offer it. A hundred percent. So on this note of tactical advice and not just being order intake, I'm curious if you can explain a little bit of something you had mentioned earlier about sitting with certain functions and shadowing their work. How have you seen that play out and what sort of strategy do you use when you're trying to shadow a role that you're hiring for? Yeah, so I think there's two parts to that. The first part is how you are strategically consulting with the hiring manager or in some cases the founder co-founder depending on the company the role and then the second is how are you approaching your colleagues your peers that might be a leader in that space or that might be an individual contributor implementing strategy and so I think when it comes to approaching other functions within a company definitely having an open mind of you know understanding where they're coming from with their expertise, right? What their goals are and understanding the tools that they're using, the processes that they're employing and how they're achieving the result, their desired results. And then from the other perspective with working with hiring managers directly, it's being able to show up strategically and say, look, this is what the market looks like, right? And it's going to differ, right? Maybe it's a role that you've worked on before and you know what that market looks like already. Maybe you're working on it for the first time. I've definitely been in that position where it's like, I can give some guidance and advice of what I think we should be targeting based on, you know, what you're telling me is needed from this role. But it's not until I actually go out into the market and I start seeing what I see that I can then come back with feedback around, okay, you wanted X, Y, Z. We're not necessarily going to be able to find someone who has all three of those, what are your top two priorities? What is a must have versus what's a nice to have, right? And starting to prioritize in that way, it's going to, again, it's going to vary very widely based on the type of role that you're hiring for, the seniority of it, what kind of industry you're in, et cetera. But it's being able to have that kind of feedback loop where this is the, this is what I'm thinking strategically in terms of how we should approach this, finding this person or filling this role. And then being able to come back and say, okay, here's the data, what I've found, right? Um, And being able to pull that data and and show that data to the hiring manager so they get a really good visual representation of what you're seeing in the market. 100%, because I feel like sometimes a hiring manager or even a recruiting team will work with a hiring manager on creating a job description before there's market research. And it will be like, we want eight plus years of experience in something that like no one would have eight plus experience in because it's a new industry or it's a new type of function. And so then it becomes very unrealistic to find people for that role. And so the feedback loop is super important in that way, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it can even go down to like the type of product, right? I have hired for a product that was yet to be built, never mind product market fit, the product itself didn't exist. And we needed to find someone who had built that product before. You can see the contradiction there, right? Nobody has built that product before because it doesn't exist yet. And so it's thinking, you know, strategically, what other types of products would have that transferable skill set that you're looking for in the engineering of this product where it has been engineered in a slightly different way or a slightly different industry, right? And so it's really kind of thinking what that moment, what that role um, really requires and, 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 you know, and realizing that it's not going to be one size fits all. Absolutely. And, and one thing I thought you said that was interesting as well was, 
and I think this is relevant for a lot of people who are are new founders and they're building their initial team. Sometimes you won't have someone in the role to shadow. So how do you go about finding people in the market to just chat with, to do your market research with? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as sourcers or recruiters, you're, you're kind of, part of you is always kind of trying to build that network, right? And so it's being open, right? If somebody doesn't meet every single requirement on paper, and I think there's also, there's, you know, there's implications for this in a lot of different ways. But one of them is, you know, broadening your network and saying, okay, maybe you don't meet X, Y, Z, but you meet at X and Y, right? Or Y and Z. And so you get on the phone with them and you start asking questions and digging into their background. And maybe there's a mutual realization of like, yeah, this isn't the perfect role for me, but you know what? I know somebody who actually does this spot on, who has done this before, right? Who might be interested in it. And so it's being open to conversations, being open to profiles when it doesn't look like the exact perfect fit of what a hiring manager has in their mind's eye and being open to kind of expanding what that might be. Now, I'm not saying go crazy, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. But I mean, you know, broadening it just enough that you can see what you're what you might be missing when it when it comes to certain profiles, certain backgrounds, things like that. Yeah, I think it all comes down to really making those educated guesses on something that could work. You don't know if it 100 percent if it will. But we also as you know, you and I have been recruiter have been recruiters for a long time. You, you also sometimes the profile that you do expect to work actually doesn't work at all. And so it is important to try these things and and broaden your scope. And as long as you have sort of like a theory and an idea and a hypothesis and you're going about it strategically, it's great to to broaden that scope because then you can confirm what the market is actually saying. Exactly. Yep. Amazing. Well, I would love to take a step back. And one question we'd like to hear from everyone about is, what when you hear hiring excellence, what does that mean to you? At this point, Jim's framework comes to mind, <laughs> the hiring excellence framework. So I'm not going to release a framework like he, like he did. I would say for me, hiring excellence is meeting a company or hiring manager where they are and understanding that it's not one size fits all. You know, I've worked on roles where the entire competitive landscape needed to be mapped by profile and timeline of every person that ever had that role at every single relevant company, public or private, bar done. I've also done the evergreen roles that need a constant stream of pipeline. I've worked with hiring managers whose worst nightmare would be to get in inundated with 100 good candidates when they just need 10 or 20 great ones. And then also the opposite, when 100 doesn't feel like enough and high volume is needed to find that needle in a haystack willing to take a chance on a seed state company, for example. And honestly, I've heard sound bites about how any one of those things is the quote unquote wrong way to do sourcing. But the truth is that every context is different, has different needs and requires a different approach. And so as a sourcer, I'd say understanding them and meeting them where they are is an important kind of hiring excellence. A hundred percent. There is definitely no one size fits all. Every organization has different philosophies, views, values. And I always revert back to like your recruiting process should what should lean on your values and how you your worldview of the organization to hire people who are going to be a good match and a good add to your organization and that's just not going to be the same across companies otherwise yep. we would all just be 100%. building and doing the same thing which we're not exactly yeah that's a great point i mean yeah every company has its own charter every company has its own mission its own vision of who they want to hire and where they want to go and so yeah, just meeting them where they're at. 100%. This brings up an actual curiosity question. And it could vary across the board, but how long does it take you to market map for a role, like on average? Or what should somebody expect? Like if um, someone's going out to do this, like what should they expect? Again, and I'm not trying to give a wishy-washy answer here, but it really depends. It depends how deep and comprehensive you need to go into it. So for the example that I gave of like every single person at every single company, I mean, that was that one example took weeks, like at least six weeks of me working almost exclusively on that project that they were in that made it particularly difficult 
intentionally to find those competitors. And so there was various levels of research required to even just find them, much less to find the people that were them. But I, I would say for your typical, you know, for your typical role, typical company, you know, a handful of hours, maybe a week of going deep on research to, to get your comprehensive market map. And again, I think it does go back to the tool, that, the platform that you're using. And we'll talk about this in the webinar. There's various different platforms out there, but they are really important for kind of streamlining your efforts and making sure you're able to do it as quickly as possible. 100%. My last question on this actually is, I'm, I'm assuming that at a point you have to sort of pause with the hiring manager and say, okay, we need to do this so we can effectively run this role. How do you encourage hiring managers to be patient with this process when a lot of times all they want is like, get the role out, get the role out, get the role out? What words of advice do you have for someone who's trying to coach a hiring manager on this? That's actually a really good question. So yeah, I think a lot of times it's like, let's just, you know, get interviews on the calendar. Let's get butts in seats. Let's get this going. Let's hire this person and turn it around real quick. And it's easy to miss all of the foundational work that goes into it before you get your first interview on the calendar from, source, from a sourcing perspective. It's going to be different when you think of online channels or referrals. From a sourcing pr perspective, there's a significant amount of foundational work that happens on the front end. And if you do that well, and you have your comprehensive or fairly comprehensive list of companies that you're targeting with the strategy behind that of why you're targeting those companies, and you're finding people that have been at those companies at the right time, that have had the right seniority and the right list of experiences before that role or after it in some cases, then you can present that data to the hiring manager and say, look, here's the X number of companies. It might be 150 companies. It might be 500 companies. It just depends. But you can say, we have sourced every single one of these. Here's the short list of candidates that actually could be a good fit for this role. If we don't find our person in this, then we have to look at what the next round of research and sourcing is going to look like because it's not going to come from this pool. And you can show that data and say, we've market mapped it. We have laid all of this out. We've gone out to everybody that's relevant. If this is, if your person is not in this cohort, then we need to think about what the next strategy is going to look like. And it's going to look different than the first. And so I think being able to show that data to hiring managers, they really get it because first they see like, wow, there's a huge amount of work that went into finding just a couple of great people to talk to and maybe our one hire eventually. But then they also understand like this is what the actual market looks like. And it starts to get very concrete for them in terms of where are we going to find the person that we really need to do this job? And what is that profile actually going to look like in reality? That's such a great piece of advice and hopefully one people can can tangibly take away. I also think sometimes you have to wait a week for it to take four weeks less. You know, the upfront time, it's, it feels counterintuitive, I think, to hire managers or founders that, well, we should just open it now, right? Because then we'll fulfill it faster. It's like, right. But if you don't do the pre-work, if you don't do all the pre-work, that's going to set you up for success. It actually is going to take longer. And so I think that's what you were mentioning is it's a very valuable part of, of the conversation there. Well, coming to our last and final question, my, my very favorite question of all, I would love to hear what is your recruiting hot take? Maybe there's too many recruiting hot takes. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's time for like a warm take, tepid take. Just kidding. I look, I won't pretend to know what's on the horizon for recruiting and TA teams. What I hope is, is that as the function continues to get more sophisticated and drive more impact, that the ability to communicate that sophistication and impact also increases so that, you know, founders and leadership teams can truly understand what their TA people bring to the table and understand that they're building and sustaining the company just as much as their marketing and engineering and customer success peers are. I couldn't agree more. It's one of those things that I think for all the progress that is made with how sophisticated talent teams are becoming, there is still that gap in the realization of that outside of TA. And so I'm really excited to see how that evolves over time. I've loved seeing 
talent leaders get promoted into VP of people. Traditionally, a lot of it was folks from HR backgrounds who were getting promoted into VPs of people. And now there's a lot of talent stream that's getting promoted up in, into those roles and CPOs. And so I think it's such a valuable, valuable thought that hopefully, hopefully evolves over time. Amazing. Well, I think we are coming up on our time. Where should people go to connect with you and, and learn more about your work? I guess just LinkedIn. I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. Happy to connect with anyone there. LinkedIn, where the recruiters and sourcers live, right? Yeah. Well, Liz, thank you so much again for joining us on Offer Accepted. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. And I'm looking forward to the more uh, tangibly focused webinar on how to go about market mapping. So thank you all for listening and we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to Offer Accepted, the podcast for ambitious recruiting professionals brought to you by Ashby, the all-in-one recruiting platform. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow and share with your TA community. We'll see you next time.